Good morning, First Family and guests. We're so glad you're with us for worship this morning. Here's a look at what's coming up. This week is Children's Music Camp. If you haven't already signed up, come tomorrow morning at 9.30. Everyone else, the show is Friday night at 7 p.m., so be sure to come and support these wonderful young performers. The Dorothy Allport Mission Offering is underway, and this year the Mission Offering will help the North Star Church Network support pastor sabbatical scholarships and the Pastor's Wives Ministry. First Baptist's goal is $10,000, so please pray for this effort and give generously. Don't forget the adult group's kickoff lunch next Sunday in the FAC. It's all about our group's ministry. If you're leading a group, you'd like to lead a group, or you want to learn more about our groups, you're invited to attend, but you have to RSVP today. Go to the Beacon or the website to register. There's an indoor picnic and games day for senior adults on Friday, August 4th in the FAC. The cost is $5 and you can register by going to the website or clicking the link in the beacon. And if you're new to First Baptist, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter, The Beacon. That's where you can find out about everything coming up at FBCA. Go to the website and click on the subscribe button. That way, you'll be in the know. Thanks so much for being here. And now, welcome to worship. Good morning, church. I can think of no better way for us to begin our time this morning in worship than by beginning with a testimony of a believer who stands before you to make a public profession of faith by following Jesus in believer's baptism. Jesus submitted himself to baptism by John, and he said, it is fitting for us to do this. And so we as a church continue to practice baptism in obedience to the Lord's command as we model the saving work of God through Christ Jesus in our lives. It's my privilege to be able to introduce to you this morning a young man who's headed into the seventh grade, Wyatt Funkhauser, and Wyatt has made a profession of faith that Jesus is his Lord, and he stands before you today to follow Jesus in his command to baptism. Wyatt, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Wyatt, because you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Good job. I also have the joy of introducing you to Mr. Fleming Baig. Fleming has also made a profession of faith that Jesus is his Lord, and he too comes today to follow Jesus in baptism. His parents are here joining me, and we're excited and rejoicing together as a church family as he follows Jesus Christ. Fleming, who is Jesus to you? Because you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. What a wonderful way for us to worship together. And may that be all of our testimonies, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Brother Don. I can't think of a better way to start a service than having a baptism. You know, uh, for, for many of you, I see those tired eyes. For many of you, this is day six this week for you to be in this place and it was my first vacation Bible school since I retired from the Coast Guard and came on staff here. This was my first vacation Bible school, and I went all in. I, I wore the T-shirt. I tried to learn the motions. Thankfully, I dodged all the cameras, so there's no record of that. But I absolutely went all in. What a wonderful week it has been. I'd like to welcome you. Please stand as we all sing together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
turn to those around you and say, welcome to worship.
Our God is good and he is so faithful and he really showed us that this past week in vacation, Bible school, lives were changed forever this past week. And yes, some of us may be a little tired today, moving a little slower, but it was all worth it. Um, some salvation decisions were made. We're still, Pastor Robert and Pastor Reed and I are still meeting with these families, but someday soon, I think you're going to see some of these public professions of faith in the baptistry. So we praise God for that. And again, we were reminded that following Jesus does truly change everything. It's, a, it's a, that's something I'm just going to keep saying over and over again and just going to continue to hold on to the truth in that. And you're here. If you're here and you don't know what we're talking about about vacation Bible school because this is your first time with us, I want to especially welcome you into our church family today. Thank you for coming to worship our Lord with us. And I would just ask you to do us a favor by uh, picking up the connection card in the pew rack near you and filling that out and then dropping it in the offering plate as it's passed by later in the service just so we can connect with you and get to know you and help you to connect with our church family. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, you are so, so good and so faithful. And we gather here in these moments to worship you, to hear from you. And Lord, may this be a time of, of just filling and you showing us what you would have us to do in the coming days and weeks. And a time of getting excited about being sent out on mission for you and following your design and your desire in our lives. And so, Lord, we do. We, we just give you this time all for your honor and for your glory. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, choir and orchestra. What a wonderful way to celebrate God in late July. You know, we tried to give the choir a month or so off, but they wanted to just keep on coming. So you're going to have them for the entire summer. And thank goodness for that commitment. You know, I told you earlier that I went all in on Vacation Bibles. I wore the t-shirt, I learned the motto, I learned the verse, and the motto this week was, following Jesus changes everything. And as I was looking through the music that we're doing, I noticed that we're singing, you are holy, Prince of Peace, which is you are holy, mighty, worthy, and I will follow. Please stand as we all sing together, you are holy. we sang, He's our Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, the living God, our saving grace. Aren't you so thankful that our Jesus broke the chains of sin and saved us by grace, canceling our sin? Please continue to sing Amazing Grace.
Thank you. Please be seated. Amen. Praise God. I want to invite you to grab God's amazing word with me and return with me to the book of Jonah. We're going to pick right back up in chapter 3. If you would like to make use of the Pew Bible that's right there in front of you, you'll find Jonah chapter 3 around page 916. We're going to continue in our summer series of our book study in the book of Jonah this morning. To continue just to report and celebrate about this last week at Vacation Bible School, on Wednesday and Thursday, we had the opportunity to share the gospel with the children and the workers that were participating in the week, and also give them the opportunity to respond. There was one young girl in particular who had indicated that she wanted to follow Jesus, and so in following up with her, I led her through a prayer of commitment. She sat right there, and after we prayed together, I said to her, I said, and I'll be following up with your parents and we'll talk about next steps. And without skipping a beat, she looked up and she said, but my mother is picking me up today. Will you talk to her then? And I said, I'll I'll make sure and connect. And she said, oh no, I want you to tell my mother today. She was just so excited, so thankful, so overwhelmed by what God was doing in her life that she didn't want to wait another day. And my prayer for you and I is that we would catch that same excitement, that same joy and that same renewal of having a God who has saved us through faith in Christ Jesus, that that joy of our salvation would be restored. This morning, we're going to continue together in Jonah chapter 3, and we've been walking with Jonah as he is struggling in being obedient to what the Lord is calling him to do. In Jonah chapter 1, we walked together as Jonah was running from the Lord, and then we saw last week together in Jonah chapter 2 as he began to run towards the Lord, and this morning in chapter 3, we're going to walk through this section of scripture together as we see what happens when Jonah and we begin to run with the Lord, when we are obedient to what he is asking us to do, and we experience the outpouring of God's power upon our lives as we run with the Lord to what he desires for you and I. I invite you to pick right back up in Jonah chapter 2 at the end in verse 10. It says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. I feel like we need to give Jonah a round of applause. I am so glad he finally obeyed. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's word reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them 
them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. As we begin again together in Jonah chapter 3, we begin almost with a story starting over. Jonah is given a second chance, a new beginning, if you will. He finds himself on dry land, removing the seaweed, flinging the whale and the fish spit from his face, and the word of the Lord comes a second time. And as the word of the Lord comes upon him a second time, I want you to notice in verse 2 that the word and the call of God has remained constant. It says in Jonah chapter 3 verse 2, God's call to Jonah is to go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. If you were to turn back to the left to chapter 1, verse 2, you will notice that the call and the command from God to Jonah remains a constant. He is to go and he is to proclaim. Jonah is given a second chance here at obeying what God has asked of him from the beginning. God is not going to let Jonah out of this call. Notice in chapter 3, verse 2, that God does not say to Jonah, Okay, Jonah, I understand that you don't like this. Jonah, I understand that this isn't something you want to do. I understand that you don't want to go and proclaim, so I will go and find someone else to go to Nineveh. God doubles down on his call. God reinstates the call that he'd put on Jonah's life from chapter 1. God is not going to let Jonah out of this call to go and to proclaim, to share and preach the message that God has given him. Jonah catches his breath, and for a second time, the word of the Lord comes upon him to go and to proclaim. Now I want you to think with me for a moment about what the Lord is asking Jonah to do. He's certainly asking him to go to a particular place, but also he's asking him specifically to proclaim. That is to speak a word. That is to share a message. God did not ask Jonah to go to the great city of Nineveh and live amongst them and set a good Christian example. God did not call Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and live amongst them and somehow hoping that they will one day ask Jonah about who his God is and how they too can come to know his God. The calling on Jonah's life is to go and to proclaim. One of the things that concerns me about the church at large in this season is that I think we have somewhat fooled ourselves into obeying this command to go and proclaim by doing something that is often called lifestyle evangelism. That is, we say to ourselves, I'm going to go and live amongst the lost in hopes that one day they will ask or one day I will get the chance to proclaim. And we're really good about building relationships, but where we struggle is a willingness to proclaim. What often happens is that we will start out with good intent about making friends and making headway into our community, and we will stop just shy of being willing to actually proclaim the message that God has given and entrusted us with. Jonah's call is to go and to proclaim. And that same call, that same commission, if you will, has gone from Jonah unto us. 
Jesus commissioned the church in Matthew chapter 28 in which he said, go and make disciples. Can anyone guess what the first step in making a disciple is? It is proclaiming the truth of the gospel. All throughout this week at Vacation Bible School, we studied the life of Peter. And I want you to remember with me for a moment when Jesus first called Peter as it's recorded in Matthew's gospel chapter 4. Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he came upon two brothers, one named Simon, who we know is Peter, and the other one named Andrew. Jesus called out to them, for they were fishermen in a boat with their father. And Jesus said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Scripture says that they dropped their nets and immediately began to follow Jesus. And Jesus did something incredible in their life. Not only did he bring about their salvation, but he put them on a course by which Jesus would use them to proclaim the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit falls upon the disciples and the believers, it is Peter who first preaches the message of the gospel and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Peter grew into his call of becoming a fisher of men. And from one generation of the church to the next, this commission and this mandate to go and proclaim has been passed on to us. One of the great men who has discipled me in my own faith, in my own walk with Jesus Christ, often said to me, Robert, if you are not fishing, then you are not following. If we are not participating in the work of helping people find and follow Jesus, then we ourselves are not fully following what Jesus asks of us as believers. There is a gospel mandate that has fallen upon the church and upon us as individual believers in which we, like Jonah, are asked to go and to proclaim, to share the message of Jesus Christ that God has entrusted to us. We can do a lot of good things, but if we fail to do the main thing, the one thing at which we are commanded and asked to do by God, we will miss out on being obedient to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can feed the hungry. We can provide metal care for the sick. We can build houses. We can make friends. We can play games. We can develop relationships. And all of those things are good. But if we never proclaim to them the truth of Jesus Christ, if we never share the gospel with them by word, then we have not met their greatest need. All we have done is made the lost more comfortable while they walk a dark and scary road into hell, eternally separated from God. Jonah has been given a mandate to go and proclaim. And we have inherited that mandate as followers of Christ. And if we are to be obedient to all the things that God desires for us, then we must go and proclaim. Jonah is given a second chance. He is given another opportunity to be obedient, to respond to this call. And today, we as individuals and we as a church are given another chance. We are given a second opportunity to say yes to God, to be obedient to the commission and the calling that he has placed upon our lives to proclaim the truth of the gospel to the ends of the earth. The message remains urgent, and it's one that we need to continue to share with all those we encounter. Listen to Jonah's message that he speaks to the Ninevites. If you look in Jonah chapter 3, verse 3, it says that Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days, 
and Nineveh will be overthrown. I have made it my life's work up to this point to study the craft of preaching. Even now, I I continue to study both current day preachers and I continue to learn more and more about the historical act of preaching all the way from the New Testament into what we experience today. But I have to tell you, in all of my education and in all of my studying, no one looks to Jonah to learn about preaching. (laughs) Jonah has a rather short and a rather simple message, eight simple words, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. No funny stories, no sermon illustrations, no preaching points, no alliteration, one simple and direct message. And you know what's so surprising about these eight words? It worked. It worked. Even though we know not only is it a short message, we know that it's a message that Jonah himself did not want to deliver. We know his hesitation from chapter 1 and chapter 2. We will see how he continues to feel about their response in chapter 4. Jonah, although obedient in delivering the message, I get the impression that he did not do it with great enthusiasm. And yet, in spite of all odds, we know historically that historians tell us that there are approximately 200,000 people in the city of Nineveh at the time that Jonah goes and proclaims the word. And what we see is that when Jonah proclaims this short, this message unto the city of Nineveh, that the entire city, some 200,000 people, turn from their wicked ways and begin to call upon the grace of God. And what we begin to glean from this moment is that if this is true, if historians are correct, that the population is around 200,000, that would make Jonah the most effective preacher and evangelist that history has ever seen. Billy Graham never saw this number from one message. In Acts, in the early church, we never see this outpouring of hundreds of thousands responding to a single word spoken from God, but Jonah in his obedience to God's command, experiences one of the greatest revivals of the turning from sin and wicked ways and submitting and looking to the grace of God. Notice the response of the people in verse 5. It says, the Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God. Although the message was short and although the messenger was flawed, they did not impale him, they did not threaten him, they did not abuse him or curse him. It says in verse 5 that the Ninevites believed God. And for a moment, we need to understand that what we see happening is that they're responding not to Jonah, they're responding to God. And in this amazing moment in Scripture, we see that when one individual is willing to be obedient to what God is asking them to do, God will unleash a power that will change lives. And for a moment in Scripture, we see obedience and the power of God coming together in a single space and time, and God being able to bring about an incredible transformation in an entire community and an entire city. Sharing the gospel and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ has never been about us, but it has always been about the power of God within the message. We are called to till the soil. We are called to plant the seeds. We, we are even called to weed around it and occasionally water. But God produces the harvest. God produces the growth. The power comes in the message, not in the messenger. And for you and I, that's a great encouragement to us that even if we're reluctant, even if we fumble over our words, when we are obedient to God, obeying his calling to proclaim, the power of the gospel is sufficient for the response. 
You know, about 10 years ago, I completely changed my view on evangelism. I was a pastor at the time, and I fell under deep conviction about my calling and the church's calling to share the gospel by word, to make it a part of our everyday lives. But on the heels of this great conviction to proclaim and share the gospel, I was wrestling with great fear, with great anxiety, and with great nerves, so much so that it was causing me to not be obedient. And so one day I came to God and I said, God, I will say yes to your calling to share the gospel. And so by saying yes to God, I entered into a season of preparation. And for months, I spent time going through the Bible and memorizing just a bountiful number of scriptures. Every scripture I could think of that began to speak about the gospel, I would begin to work and commit to memory. In that same season, I memorized over 12 ways to share the gospel in different presentations. And every single person I encountered, whether it was a believer, whether it was someone in my family, even to my own pets in that household, I sat down and I said, I'm working on sharing the gospel. Let me practice in front of you. And I began over and over again, practicing sharing the gospel. And one day, the Lord started doing something in my life. And he started sending me people who wanted to hear the gospel. There was one day in particular, I was on a military drill weekend, and there was a new soldier who had come to the unit, and so I got introduced to him as the chaplain, and immediately he said to me, chaplain, are you free for lunch? I thought this is a great opportunity to get to know him, and so I agreed to lunch, and we met at a restaurant. The waitress showed us to our seat, handed us our menus, and she walked away. And before she ever returned to take our drink order, he looks across the table and he says, Chaplain, I want to know what it means to be saved by Jesus. And before she ever returned to take our drink order, I had led this young soldier through a prayer of commitment, and his life had been drastically changed through the gospel message. The same day at two o'clock in the afternoon, I got a phone call from someone in my church and it was a man who was terminally ill. And he says to me on the other end of the line, I don't know if I am saved or not. Will you please share the gospel message with me? And over the phone in a completely different city, I shared the gospel message and led him through a prayer of commitment and he made a profession of faith. The same day at 7.30 that night, I receive an email from a member of our church whose child expressed interest in making a profession of faith. And they said, will you come over tonight and share the gospel with our child who wants to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? In three days, or excuse me, in one day, God had sent me three people who were hungry to hear the gospel message. If you are willing to say yes to God and obey his command, he will send you a flood of opportunity. This is what he's done in Jonah's life. They're not responding to him. They're not responding to his message, but they're responding because God is doing a work in their hearts. And when we are obedient, God is faithful and God will do the work of saving. Even if we're reluctant, even if we're hesitant, even if we fumble through the presentation, God is so powerful to save that he will stir in someone's heart the profession of faith just as he has done in you. Jonah has the opportunity to experience one of the greatest awakenings that the world has ever seen from a willingness to surrender to God's work in his lives. Our job is to show up and speak up. What God has asked us to do as a church is to show up and speak up to show up in our community, in our places of work, in our family, and speak up, to speak the truth of the gospel message. We are so quick to tell one another about restaurants and movies and sports teams, but we are so slow to tell people the truth about Jesus Christ. But as Paul has reminded us in Romans chapter 1, 
The power unto salvation is in the gospel message. And Paul says that unto all who will believe, they can be saved. Many of us in the room are familiar with Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says this, all who call on the name of the Lord will be But do you remember what verse 14 says? Let me continue Paul's teaching. He says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all Israelites accept the good news. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. The church has been entrusted with the message and the word about Jesus Christ, and we have been called to go and proclaim. There is not a spiritual gift of evangelism. There is not some who are endowed with this gift and others who are not. There are not some who are called to share the gospel and others who are not. We are all called by God to do the work of the evangelist. And when we say yes to God, we will get a front row seat to the power of God falling upon people's lives and bringing about a transformation not only in their own lives, but in their eternity. Jonah chapter 3 is an example of one man who is obedient to the call to go and proclaim. Church, can you imagine the vision and the outcome that would happen if we collectively, as a church, said yes to God? Not one of us, but all of us. If all of us were willing to say, as Jonah has said, yes, Lord, I will go and I will proclaim. Every one of us has people in our community, in our family, in our neighborhood, who need to hear the gospel-saving message. Not all will respond, as we read in Romans chapter 10, but some will. And just as we see in Jonah chapter 3, God does this amazing thing. And he says to us in chapter 3 verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. There are some in your family and some in your community who will experience the grace of God in the same manner if you will share. If you will show up and speak up, they have the potential to receive the power of God through salvation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel. We thank you for what it means to us and the way in which you have stirred in our hearts salvation. But Father, I pray that you would call us as a church, that you would give us a vision and excitement, and you would help us catch the calling that you have placed upon us to go and to proclaim. But Father, I recognize that we all need help to be obedient to what you have asked. And so Father, I pray that you would help us overcome our hesitation that you would help us overcome our anxiety and our fear. And that, Father, as we say yes to you, we would be able to gain a glimpse of the power and the way in which you were able to use the gospel message to save a soul. Thank you, Father, for the power of the gospel message. May we be good stewards 
of what you have entrusted to our care. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a brief moment and respond to God in worship. You may have come to worship this morning with a desire to follow God. Perhaps he's been calling you to join the first family. We want to invite you to come. But maybe you're here today and you want to respond to the gospel message. We would love to celebrate and lead you in that prayer of commitment. But whatever the Lord has stirred in your heart, let us all take a moment and respond to what God is doing in our lives. Let's stand together as Brother Don and Olivia lead us in this time of worship. Go ahead and be seated. We're going to have the opportunity to continue in our worship through our tithes and offerings. I'm going to invite our ushers and our deacons to come forward and help us as we continue together in worship this morning. But as they come, let me continue to lead us through a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way in which you have loved us and the way in which you have brought about our salvation. You have said in your word, Father, that while we were dead in our sins, Christ Jesus has died for us. Father, thank you for receiving us just as we are, for washing us, making us clean, and giving us a new life in Christ Jesus. Father, we truly owe our lives unto you, and we desire to glorify you with every breath. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Bill and Cynthia. Aren't some families just packed with talent? It's impressive. We're so blessed as a church to have all the music and worship leadership. It's a joy for me to be able to introduce to you Miss Jennifer Chisholm. I'm going to invite her to come up. Jennifer has come today to join the first family, but she's come to do so by making a public profession of faith through believers' baptism. So if you would celebrate that and welcome her. <laughs> Praise God. And I hope that following our service, you'll come by and extend to her that right hand of fellowship as we celebrate all that God is doing amongst our church family and adding to, and so we welcome you. Thank you for being here. I want to say one last word to you before we go and sing a song of benediction together. Many of you by, know, by now know that Pastor Eric, our pastor to students, has followed a new call to join another church to continue his ministry here within our community. And we are excited and thankful for what Eric has done here amongst First Baptist Church. And we are prayerfully sending him out as he goes. And so I want to invite you to join together and take a moment and just write Eric a note of encouragement and a word of thanksgiving to him and to his family for the season in which God has had them amongst our fellowship. If you go out these doors to your right at our welcome center, you'll find a table with some thank you cards. Let me encourage you as you go this morning, stop by and take a moment and write Eric and his family a note. And as they go, they will be able to read these cards and have just a word of encouragement for them as they go and continue to do the work of the gospel here in Alexandria. And so let's join together and encourage them and give thanks to God for their obedience and the season of ministry that he has had amongst our fellowship. We're going to close together by singing a song of benediction. And so I want to invite you to stand together one more time. And then Brother Don and Olivia will lead us in a song as we close. Let's leave today singing about God's goodness. dismissed.